Today I'll be reviewing the Hammer horror film The Curse of Frankenstein. While Universal Horror had done loads of silent films and their success with their first talkie, Dracula, led to Frankenstein, the mummy, and such, with Hammer it was a little bit different. The Curse of Frankenstein was Hammer's first color film, and it led to the creation of other series based on Dracula, the mummy, and others. While previous adaptations had taken cues from the novel or from various stage productions, Hammer's The Curse of Frankenstein is more of an original tale that takes the basic framework of the familiar story and gave it several updates and tweaks. Unlike Universal series, which focused mostly on the creature, the Hammer Frankenstein films focused mainly on Frankenstein himself, played by Peter Cushing, who would also go on to star as Van Helsing in their Dracula films. Also, interestingly enough, the creature in this film is played by Christopher Lee, who would go on to famously play Dracula in those movies. The Hammer Frankenstein series is great, with each one having Frankenstein become more and more sinister, and a different creature every time, so it never got stale. The Curse of Frankenstein is the first one. In this one, Frankenstein is awaiting execution for murdering his maid, and he recounts his tale to a priest hoping to escape execution by convincing his captors that it was not he who murdered the girl, but rather a creature that he had created. The flashback portion starts with Frankenstein as a teenage boy. His father had died years previous, and his mother had now just died, leaving him alone and with the title of Baron Frankenstein. He hires a tutor, Paul Krem, played by Robert Urquhart, and together they tackle the mysteries of science. By the time Frankenstein is an adult, they are more partners than tutor and student, and they manage to crack the secret of life and death, and demonstrate it by successfully resurrecting a dog. While they're both rather pleased with themselves, and Kremp wants to immediately publish their findings, Frankenstein wants to take it a step further, seeing as it's not good enough to merely restore life to a dead body, but he wants to create new life. He convinces Kremp to go along with this, despite his trepidation. Meanwhile, his cousin Elizabeth moves in, who wants to marry him. Okay, well, that sounds pretty fucked up, but they're so open about it that it makes me think that was just how it was done back then, I guess. In the beginning of the film, you see his cousin as a young girl, and his aunt, who had been receiving financial allowance from Frankenstein's mother, appeals to him to continue to pay. He agrees, and she practically tries to pimp her own daughter out to him in gratitude. Later you learn that not only had they arranged a marriage between the two cousins, but that she genuinely loves him and believes that he loves her, though he's too busy banging his maid. I don't mean to focus on this so much, but it really shows how much of a sleaze Frankenstein is in this movie. However odd we may see it now, the girl really does love him, and he obviously doesn't give a shit about her. He's, she's nothing more to him than payment in full for the financial help he gave her mother and he's still messing around with the maid as they plan their wedding. And he doesn't love the maid either, but he sees her as a vessel for his own pleasure, to be tossed aside when no longer needed. Anyway, Frankenstein needs the framework of a body, so he obtains the body of a hanged highwayman, though he removes the head as it has been ravaged by birds, and the hands which he finds to be clumsy. He arranges to get the hands of a recently deceased master sculptor and eyes from a local morgue. So far, Frankenstein comes off as a dick, but when he goes after the brain, you see how low he's willing to stoop. He invites a famous professor over to stay at his manor, then outright murders the man. He makes it look like an accident, and acts like he feels terrible about the whole thing, and has the professor buried in his family crypt. To the public, it seems like a sign of goodwill, but he just wants easy access to the man's brain. Kremp has since refused to take part in the experiments, but continues to live in a house to protect Elizabeth, whom he's obviously smitten with. Kremp can't prove that Frankenstein murdered the man, but attempts to stop him from using the brain, and in the scuffle, it's damaged. While Kremp tries to reason with Frankenstein and even threaten him into not going through with his experiment, a bolt of lightning strikes the machinery, causing the process to start on its own, giving birth to the creature who, instead of a perfect specimen, is a violent, almost mindless creature, due to the brain damage. The creature attacks Frankenstein, but is subdued, and later escapes his bonds. When they discover it wandering around in the woods, Kremp promptly shoots it in the head, believing the ordeal to be over. However, Frankenstein digs up the creature's body and repairs the damage and gives it life once more. When the maid finds out that Frankenstein is planning to marry his cousin and not her, she flips out. She threatens to reveal the experiments to the authorities, 
but he quickly realizes she doesn't actually know anything about the experiments and fires her. She sneaks around the house, attempting to find something to blackmail him with, but the creature finds her instead and kills her. It then escapes its bonds again and goes on a rampage, ending when it is shot again and falls into a vat of acid, dissolving completely. At the end, we're treated to the fate of Frankenstein, where Paul Kremp comes to visit the condemned man and refuses to go along with the story of the creature, claiming that he knows nothing of such a creature. Frankenstein is beheaded, and Kremp and Elizabeth wind up together. Of course, the movie's success led to a whole series of Hammer Frankenstein movies, so it would later turn out that Frankenstein ducked out of his own execution somehow and would return again and again, but without knowing that, it's a pretty jarring end. The movie is typical of Hammer films, Doc and Garthic, with plenty of blood, great performances, and grisly death scenes. As the movie focuses more on Frankenstein and less on his creations, the best parts involve him. Those of you who saw Star Wars know how well Peter Cushing plays an evil son of a bitch, and this is your chance to see him in his prime. Coincidentally, I found that George Lucas must have been a huge fan of Hammer Horror, as the Star Wars movies are heavily sprinkled with cast members from the classic Hammer films. Even David Prowse, who was the man in the Darth Vader suit, once played one of Frankenstein's creations. The only disappointing part of the film is the creature itself, which doesn't do much more than lumber around like a zombie. It doesn't even make menacing sounds like Boris Karloff did. Interestingly, Hammer originally wanted Boris Karloff to play Baron Frankenstein, but it just didn't work out that way. Christopher Lee is pretty much wasted as the creature, as he lumbers around and swipes his arms at people dumb enough to get near him, but he doesn't exude any of the real menace that he would later on as Dracula. The creature isn't really important in the movie, but I would have liked if it was a bit more frightening, or if Christopher Lee had a chance to flex his acting muscles more. That being said, it's still a great movie. I remember seeing it on TV as a kid and being blown away by how good it was. And it was the start of a great series. I do like the Universal movies a bit better, though, so I'll give The Curse of Frankenstein an 8 out of a possible 10.